I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die No one really knows why gravity exists Naming something does So as as Tucker was, was mentioning, I'm a comparative psychologist. And what that means is that in our lab, we compare the ways in which different animals think. And particularly, we are interested in the question of what makes the thinking of humans, what makes the sort of the cognition of humans so different from that of other animals. And we are particularly focusing on comparisons between humans and one of our closest living relatives, chimpanzees. And I want to share with you in the next 30 to 40 minutes some of our recent findings and sort of what we as a field, what comparative psychology has found out about human intelligence in the last 10 to 15 years. So, you know, if you, if you speak to an evolutionary biologist or if you speak to an ecologist and you ask them to to define a successful species. They often define a successful species in terms of how widespread it is across the globe. So in terms of how many different environments it inhabits. And ac according to this criterion, one of the most successful species are ants. So here you see a distribution of ant species across our planet. So in all the, you know, areas um, marked in red, we find ants. So, you know, everywhere from, from the most southern tip of Tierra del Fuego to the northern Siberian plains, you will find ants. So from an evolutionary perspective, ants are an extremely successful species. And ants have achieved this evolutionary success by speciation. So there are 14,000 different species of ants in our planet. Each plant species has a specific genetic adaptation to their local environment. Another extremely successful species from this evolutionary perspective that biologists often mention is our own species, Homo sapiens. So as, as many of you might be aware, we are a species Homo sapiens that has emerged around 200,000 years ago, somewhere in East Africa here. We have then left Africa, we have left East Africa, and we've basically colonized the rest of our, our planet in the, in the last um, 100,000 to 200,000 years. So just like ants, we seem to be able to adapt to a variety of different environments. Again, you know, from the most southern tip of Tierra del Fuego to the most northern si Siberian plains. But I think this raises a, a pretty striking question because notice that we are not 14,000 different species like ants. We're just one species, right? We're just Homo sapiens. And we actually have extremely little genetic variation in our species. So our closest living relatives, chimpanzees, who all live somewhere close to the equator here in Sub-Saharan Africa, they actually have more genetic variation than Homo sapiens, but they all live in very, very similar environments. So how can we explain human evolutionary success? How can we explain the fact that we live in all these different environments on our planet, but we don't really seem to have any specific genetic adaptations to surviving and thriving in these various ecologies? So this is sort of the, the big question that I want to talk to you about today. And the talk is divided into two parts. So in the first part, I will speak about a new evolutionary process that I think can explain this extraordinary evolutionary success of Homo sapiens. And that evolutionary process, as can be guessed from my title, is culture. And then in the second part, I'm gonna dive a little bit more into the sort of research that we do into comparative psychology. And I will zoom in on one specific psychological mechanism that has evolved in humans and that allows us to have culture. And this psychological mechanism is social learning. Okay, so the big question is, 
how can we as humans adapt to all these different environments without being genetically predisposed to doing so? And as I've already pointed out, a variety of, of theorists have recently pointed out that the solution is culture. So for example, if you're interested in this, in, in further reading on this, I, I encourage you to, to check out the work of Celia Hayes, for example, or Rob Boyd. So the idea is that as humans, we can survive and thrive in all of these different environments that you can see depicted here, because we form these highly cooperative social groups, cultures, that then collaboratively adapt to their local environment. So I think the sort of really key here is that as humans, we don't adapt genetically to our environment, like all other animals, but we adapt culturally to our environment. And let me just, you know, now I've used that term culture quite a lot. Let me just um, give you an idea what I mean by that term. So by culture, I understand the large body of practices, techniques, heuristics, tools, motivations, values, and beliefs that we acquire from those around us while growing up. And let me also give you, a, give you an example of a specific cultural adaptation. So take, for example, human populations living in the central Arctic in Canada. How can they survive in these extremely inhospitable environments? Well, the solution is they have cultural innovations, they have cultural adaptations that allow them to survive and thrive in these environments. For example, like the igloo. Now this might, maybe the igloo might seem something sort of quite everyday and maybe not that exciting to you, but sort of from my scientific perspective, the igloo really is one of these sort of, as, is, uh, as it is, is described here in the figure caption, it's a commonplace wonder. So let me just, just read this text to you here briefly. The design of an igloo is non-obvious and highly adaptive. It takes decades for individuals to grow and learn to build one, and it took generation for the design to evolve. The developmental, cultural, and evolutionary dynamics that produce commonplace wonders like the igloo remain poorly understood. However, human societies in all regions depend upon material and immaterial products of this kind. Okay, so what I've done so far is that I've really highlighted the role of culture in human evolution. And I want to highlight two more consequences of considering culture and its role in human evolution. The one, the first consequences is something that in the literature, sorry, do you also see this green um, line on my slides? Yeah, okay, okay, let me try. Sorry, I don't know where that's coming from. Let me see whether I can briefly remove this and maybe clear the razor. Oh, great, gone. Okay, so the one consequence of, or the one characteristic that is special about human culture, it's that it's a cumulative culture. What does that mean? Human culture evolves over time. It changes over time. It complexifies over time. It sometimes even becomes better over time. And I've given you an example of cumulative culture here. You can see how the wheel has evolved over the last 150 years. So cult human culture evolves. And actually that's something that's unique to humans. If you look to, at other very, very intelligent animals, like for example, birds, and you look at their culture. So here's an example of Sorry, here's an example of birds' nests and how they've evolved over the last 3 million years. They're basically the same. So this tendency for our cultural adaptations to evolve over time is one thing that makes us humans very different from other species. Now, the second characteristic of, of culture that I wanna highlight is this idea of culture as a biological adaptation. So traditionally, and I would say that was even the view until about two decades ago or so, people would think of biology and culture as two distinct phenomena without much interaction. Biology, that's what the other, other animals are, and culture, that's, the human, that's only human beings. 
Now, today's view is, is a very different view. Today's view supposes that culture is part of our bio biology. We are biologically predisposed to participate in cultures. Culture is our way of responding to the sort of challenges that our environment exposes us to. So this is the first part of my talk, culture as a new evolutionary process. I would then move on, to, or maybe now Tucker would be a good um, time in case there are any questions. Yes, let's see, I am watching the chat bar. I have not seen a question yet, except your question asking me if I'm related to Henry Hyatt. <laughs> and I am not. <laughs> well, if he's, as long as he's not in jail, I, that, that pleases me that you would ask. Let's see. We have a question from uh, E.J. E. Chichilinski. Is it really true that no other animals have evolving cultures? Yes, I know. I know that it's that's hard to hard to believe. I was also first very surprised when I when I when I encountered this fact. But so far, we have we have not encountered a different species that so systematically passes on and improves culture over generations. Notice that, let me just maybe briefly go back to this slide. Notice that cumulative culture depends on two processes, imitation and innovation. So a new generation has to first learn their ancestors culture and then they can innovate upon this template. And interestingly, people always think that innovation is the hard part. Innovation is, is the sort of process that requires big brains. But as Jane Goodall has convincingly argued, chimpanzees can innovate, but interestingly, they cannot imitate. So the imitation part of the previous generation's culture seems to be the difficult, the difficult process. Thank you. We have a question here. First, Werner Hogg says to everyone, bears learn over generations how to steal food from humans. But I take it that's a rather more restricted example of cultural evolution. <laughs> Yes. Um, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if this is individual. So the important distinction is individual learning versus social learning. So my suggestion would be that bears learn this behavior individually. It's not something that is being taught by their, you oh, know, no. Uh, oh, no. mother or father or caregivers. No, 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 no. This is being taught. This is being passed down from generation to generation. This is being taught because bears in the past did not know how to do this. We could go camping without... Um, without fear of bears taking our food, but now we can never do that anymore. Um, so this is definitely being passed down, but it's a small, a small idea. It's, it's, it's not very broad, as you say. Interesting. Yeah, we, we should do a, a study on this to get some data. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot more examples I've heard of, but, but, yeah. very, but very narrow in scope, of course. <clears throat> Jan, Alex Paul asks, are there genes that are responsible for our cooperative abilities? And what if those genes were transplanted or gene edited into another animal like ants or bees or perhaps bears? That is, that is a, a difficult question and it's a good question. So are there genes that specifically um, that can specifically explain our cooperative abilities? So I don't think anyone has really managed to zoom in on one genes or a few specific genes that, for example, explain our altruism or our empathy. But there definitely seem to be genes that, for example, explain our greater social tolerance. So the sort of prerequisite for cooperation is that you're tolerant of people around you. So that, that only puts you in a position where you can actually start collaborating with other people. And regarding your second question about, you know, uh, transporting these genes into other animals, I mean, up to now, um, th this definitely has not been possible, but as, as some of you might be aware, Jennifer Doudna mm -hmm. here at, at UC Berkeley just received the Nobel Prize in chemistry for her development of the mechanism CRISPR-Cas, which allows you to gene edit. So maybe in the future, something like this will be possible. <clears throat> Great, John, thank you. Why don't, reminding everyone that there'll be time for questions certainly at the end of, of Jan's presentation, but perhaps at another pausing point. Jan, why don't you go return to your presentation? Absolutely. Thank you very much for these interesting questions.
So as I was saying before, what we do in my lab is that we use a comparative approach to answer questions about human thinking. And humans, we are mammals, we are primates, we are great apes, we are one of five great apes. Our closest primate relatives are orangutans, gorillas, bonobos, and chimpanzees. All, all, so um, all of the gorillas, bonobos, and chimpanzees all live in, in Africa. Um, orangs are the only primate besides humans that don't live in, in Africa. They live, for example, in Indonesia. And so what we do in our, our research is that we try to compare human beings to chimpanzees and bonobos, our two closest primate relatives. And you know, one thing that I always find fascinating is that the comparative approach actually has very, very deep roots. If you, for example, think, look at the Western intellectual tradition, you can, you can all already see Aristotle explicitly comparing human beings to other animals. But you know, Aristotle and, and uh, his, his colleagues, they were at a real disadvantage when comparing humans to other animals, because at that time in Europe, you, you only had, you know, uh, sheep, goats, um, and other domesticated species. So the gap between humans and other animals seemed vast. This actually only changed in the 19th century when the first non-human primates came to zoos in, in Europe. And uh, there's this funny anecdote that um, it was in 1838 that Charles Darwin actually encountered his first non-human primate. And that was the famous orangutan Jenny at London Zoo. And you know, Darwin was completely blown away by this encounter with a non-human primate. And a few days later, he wrote one of his most famous quotes in his notebook, which is, he who understands baboon would do more towards metaphysics than Locke. So this story is, is to show that today we're in a much better position. We can compare humans to their closest living relatives. And you know, when I, when I speak to people and I ask them, so why do you think humans have taken such a, such a different evolutionary path than even our closest primate relatives? And remember that the genes of chimpanzees are about 99% identical to our genes. So when I ask people, a common answer that I get is that, is what I call hypothesis one here, which, which, is, which, I, which I labeled here general intelligence. So people often say, well, humans are just more intelligent than other animals. Humans are just more intelligent than chimpanzees, for example. A second hypothesis that I sometimes come across, or that's at least pretty prevalent in the literature, is this hypothesis that I label here specific intelligence. So that hypothesis says, well, humans are not generally more intelligent, but we have a specific type of intelligent that explains our, our unique evolutionary path. And this specific intelligence I will call cultural intelligence. Now, you know, hypothesis one, this, this idea that humans are just generally more intelligent than other animals, you just need to look at a few animal behavior studies and you will already know that this cannot be the case. And I just wanna give you two of my favorite examples here that I think nicely demonstrate the extraordinary intelligence of chimpanzees. So I hope we don't have any bandwidth problems here. These are, these are two videos or actually three videos that I'm gonna show to you now. So this is a famous study by two Japanese primato primatologists, Inoue and Matsusawa. And what they test is memory, is short-term memory and attention in chimpanzees. And what you will see is this chimpanzee is presented with digits from one to nine for a very short time on the screen. But the chimpanzee can immediately remember the sequence and tap the correct sequence. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna let the video run. Thank you. 
Okay, so there was one mistake here right now, but otherwise this is just amazing, right? Um, I would definitely not be able to do this. So here's, here's one, one other example, I think, of the extraordinary intelligence of, of chimpanzees. This is actually from at one of the locations where we also do our research. This is at Ngamba Island Chimpanzee Sanctuary, which is a sanctuary for chimpanzees that's located in Lake Victoria in, um, in Uganda. And uh, let me describe to you the experimental setup, okay? So th there's a very small, narrow tube here. I hope you can see it. And at the bottom of that tube, there's a peanut, one peanut. Chimpanzees love peanuts, so they will do everything. They will use all their intelligence to obtain a peanut. And the setup here is one, you know, where you can see chimpanzees have straw here, they have access to water, there are maybe some ropes lying around in that room. And now the question is, can chimpanzees obtain that peanut? Do they know how to obtain that peanut? And notice that, of course, the, the, um, the tube is too narrow for them to place their fingers in the tube. So I'm not gonna put you to test, but maybe you can think about it for a second. What's the intelligent solution here? Now it turns out, that 50% of the chimpanzees of this group spontaneously, without training, found the solution. The peanut. So this is an extraordinary example of what we call physical cognition, physical thinking, because it involves thinking about the physical world. It involves variables such as causality, space. The chimpanzee basically has to understand that peanuts float, that if they put water into the tube that will um, minimize the space in the tube and will push the peanut to the top. So it's a really, yeah, when I saw these videos for the first time and, and these re research findings, I really couldn't believe it. I often give, give the, this task to students, by the way, in my lectures, and there are quite a number of students who can't come up with that solution. <clears throat> One thing that makes working with chimpanzees so, I don't know, so <laughs> amazing is that just like humans, they I think they have real personalities um, and that is expressed in a number of different ways. So for example, you know, when I come back, usually I go back to, to Kenya and Uganda once or twice a year to work with the chimpanzees. Now, unfortunately, I haven't seen them since March when we had to leave Kenya very quickly because of the pandemic. So I'm missing them. But the interesting thing is talking about personalities that whenever I come back to the chimpanzees and I've worked with them for about 10 years, you can really tell that some of the chimpanzees, just like humans, like me, other chimpanzees don't really care so much for me. So I, when I come there, back there, I've been gone for half a year, some immediately come to greet me, seem to be very happy to see me, others hardly notice me at all. Another way in which personality expresses itself is that some chimpanzees are clearly more lazy than other chimpanzees. But I always say when, when showing this video is that you can be lazy as long as you're creative. And this chimpanzee is actually known for being lazy, but also creative in his solutions. So he, you will see him at the beginning of the video, he's sort of looking to the place where he can get water, but then it seems to be, he seems to be sort of saying, oh, this is so much work to get all this water. So he comes up with a simpler solution. Yeah. 
chimpanzees don't have the same level of disgust that we have. Yeah. At the end, he also got the peanut. Okay, so remember that I was talking before about these two types of intelligence, uh, of, of these two types of hypotheses, Expe uh, excuse me, the general intelligence hypothesis and the cultural intelligence hypothesis. And my, so my PhD supervisor, Esther Herman, who is at the University of Portsmouth in, in the UK, she did this really amazing study 13 years ago where she systematically tested between these two hypotheses. And what she did is she basically developed nonverbal intelligence tests. And she gave these nonverbal intelligence tests to 105 two and a half year old children, 106 chimpanzees, and 32 orangutans. And the nonverbal intelligence tests, they could be classed into two domains. One was the physical domain, so intelligence about the physical domain including intelligence about things such as space, quantities, and causality. The other domain was called cultural domain, and that included nonverbal intelligence tests of things such as intelligence, theory of, uh, sorry, not intelligence, theory of mind, social learning, and communication. And I'm, since I'm already, how am I doing on time? Oh, I'm doing okay. So let me, let me show you the results from this large nonverbal intelligence test battery. So I'm sorry if this is a little bit small. So here on the y-axis, so on the, on the vertical axis, you can basically see how successful the three different species were. And here on the horizontal axis, you can see our three species. You can see human children, you can see chimpanzees and orangutans. And here, these are the results for the intelligence tests that test space. Here are the results from the intelligence tests that tap into quantities. And finally, causality. And as you can see, maybe you can just pay attention to the sort of black horizontal bars. You can see that humans and chimpanzees, they were basically on par here in terms of their performance in these nonverbal intelligence tests. Human children didn't really seem to systematically outperform their closest primate relatives. So what this suggests, now I'm grouping these, these different domains together here, what this, this suggests is that when it comes to the physical domain, humans don't really seem to be particularly intelligent. Now, what about the cultural domain? Did human children systematically outperform other, or yeah, do better than their closest primate relatives in the cultural domain? Again here, I have three different graphs for you that sort of uh, work in exactly the same way as the previous graphs. This one was testing social learning. This one tested communication. And this one tested theory of mind. So theory of mind basically tests how good an individual is at understanding another agent's mind. And here you can see a very clear pattern emerged. Already two and a half year old children seem to be much better at social learning than chimpanzees much better at comprehending communication and much better at theory of mind. So if I again put these different studies together, these different intelligence tests together, we can see that in the cultural domain, it really seems to be the case that there's something interesting going on when it comes to human intelligence. Humans seem to have a special type of intelligence and that's cultural intelligence. So notice that this pattern of results that we have seen now presents really strong evidence against the general intelligence hypothesis. Because the general intelligence hypothesis would predict that humans are just generally more intelligent than other primate species. But that's not the case. As you can see here in the physical domain, we're completely on par with our primate relatives. So this pattern of results supports the cultural intelligence hypothesis humans have evolved a special type of intelligence, a social intelligence, and that is what explains our extraordinary evolutionary path over the last 200,000 years. Okay, so these are my, my two last slides. So I've, I've sort of, I've tried to give you one possible answer of how we can explain human evolutionary success. 
How can we explain the fact that we live in all these different environments, that we, you know, that we inhabit more environments than any other terrestrial mammal, and that we have inhabited all of these different environments in such a short time, in just the last 200,000 years, from an evolutionary perspective, an extremely short time. So that's the question I asked today. And the answer that I offered was that human evolutionary success can be explained by our abilities to engage in culture. So maybe the sort of slogan with which I wanna end here is that as humans, we are not individually smart. One individual human is not, is not smarter than other animals. As humans, we are socially smart. When we put our heads together and we exchange information and we work together, we can come up with common, commonplace wonders like this igloo that you can see here. So that's it. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And I'm, I'm looking forward to your questions. Great, Jan, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I bet the questions will start to arise here, both in the chat and perhaps if you want to signify by raising your hand, either your virtual hand, there you go, there's Stuart Y, um, or a, a physical hand vis visible with, to your, uh, your camera, I'll do my best to call on you. So how about this? Uh, Stuart Y, please go ahead and ask your question. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great, okay, uh, thank you for the presentation, enjoyed it immensely. Uh, certainly made me think about how we, um, we as human parents, we teach our children at home and also at school. Uh, we force them to learn at school. Uh, and uh, the, the learning at school is built on societal knowledge of many centuries and, and cultures. Uh, as Newton's famous metaphor says that we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, y yes? Um, my question would, would actually be um, at the risk of taking uh, the topic out of this world, uh, I'll ask it anyway. Um, when animal populations are separated by distance or other barrier, they become separate species. And I think that uh, it's possible that when we humans move out into space and populate various widely distant uh, planets, we may become separate species. What would your thoughts be on how um, that would affect our, um, our culture um, and our shared knowledge? Yeah, and types of human species that we might might um, might experience or might see in the in the distant future. So first of all, let me just uh, say one thing, which is that we're li living in a very very un sort of un in a. No, let me sorry. Let me start in a different way. For the majority of the of the history of Homo sapiens, actually Homo sapiens was not the only Homo species around. So Homo is our genus name, right? And sapiens is our species name. And for most of our histories, we shared the earth with Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalensis, Homo florensis, Homo denisovans. So we were not the only Homo species on our planet. This is an extremely recent phenomenon. So Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis, only went extinct about 30,000 years ago. So actually this sort of interesting scenario that you sketch about many different human species potentially in the future is something that, that is sort of very common from our evolutionary past. And um, more specifically with regard to, to your question about what will that mean for human culture if we have, have many different human species potentially in the future, well, I think one, one can only hope that we can scale up cooperation to a large enough level so that, these, that the interactions between these different homo species in the future are characterized by cooperation rather than competition. Unfortunately, our evolutionary history doesn't give us so much hope here because still one of the you know, most widely accepted theories of why Neanderthals went in extinct, for example, um, are all of us basically, right? Is Homo sapiens. So one of the theories is that, that Homo sapiens is basically the reason that we don't see Neanderthals anymore. Yeah, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jan. I wonder if I could persuade Mariel Goudou, who is a former, no, a current Wonderfest Science Envoy to put her long paragraph in the chat window here into words. Mariel, if you're still with us, can you explain what this paragraph you've written in the chat is about? 
Oh no, we've lost Mariel. Oh. No, no, I'm here, I'm here. No, no, that was, that was simply the, um, that was just the, so someone was asking about the age of the children in the study that he was citing, the 2007 um, Esther Hermann et al. study. And so I just went and copied and pasted it for people who were interested. Uh, the kids in the study, it looks like were, were two and a half years old, so they were toddlers. Um, so that's the, that's the abstract that I put in there. And then if you wanna see a link to the full thing, you can click the PDF. <laughs> that's all that that was. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Godou. <laughs> All right, let's see. We have a question here from, uh, ah, I don't want to make sure, um, from ja Jan, Jan Altman, not to be confused with Jan, this is Jan. How can our professor Eng Eng Englund, how can he say that some non-human animals are more intelligent than humans? Can another animal play a piano? Can it speak a language, do calculus? Yeah, so I would, the way I would put it is that it is, I don't find it convincing to speak of intelligent as one unitary construct. I don't really think that you can say that like humans are more intelligent than other animals. I think that humans have a very specific type of intelligence, cultural intelligence, and the examples that you gave are perfect examples of cultural intelligence, like playing the piano is, of course, something that has a very long cultural history that was passed on across generations. So it's a perfect example of what I've been talking about, of our social intelligence. But there are some animals that can do intelligently do things that we could never do. So remember the first video that I showed of the chimpanzee remembering all these digits in such a sort of quick and automatic way, this is a level of memory and attention that the human species doesn't have. So I would say that chimpanzees are extremely intelligent animals as well, and they're in some ways more intelligent than humans. Jan, um, a, uh, I wanna read this question from Mitch Diamond. He asks, can, can you address if or how meta representation applies to your cultural intelligence thesis? How meta representation occurs? Okay, okay. How it applies to the thesis of cultural intelligence. Okay, I'm, I think, um, so meta representation is a technical term um, and it um, requires quite a long introduction. Let me see if I can do this very quickly. So, the, the dominant theory of how our mind works is the representational theory of mind. So you can think of our mind a little bit like a map. A map represents the environment. Google Maps helps us, represents the environment and thereby helps us to find our way. And one dominant theory is that our whole mind basically works like a map. So we represent the environment. And then there is a more complicated form of representation, which is called meta-representation. So this basically means that, for example, we represent the mental states of someone else. So I, for example, represent what Tucker is thinking right now. That would be an example of, of meta-representation. And now to the specific question, I would say that everyone in the literature agrees that meta-representation is an extremely important and extremely basic cognitive prerequisite for many cultural abilities. So just think about language, our form of communication. It seems to be the case that we need to meta-represent others' mental states in order to understand what they're communicating, in order to understand, for example, what they want to teach us in a given situation. So many people like, for example, Dan Sperber argue that meta-representation and culture are very closely intertwined. Thank you, Jan. E.J. Chichilniski has a question that he'd like to ask himself, his own voice. E.J., please take it away. Thank you. Um, that was an incredibly interesting presentation. Um, it's very convincing about the whole, the whole cultural passing down, passing down knowledge and, and so on. But I, I, I want to ask a question about how that knowledge is developed in the first place. Somebody had to invent the igloo. And there are individuals who invent spectacular things. Now, in support of what you've said, those spectacular things get passed down. So somebody invented the piano. Somebody invented the first musical instrument. The measurements on children 
is are is in a very as I understand them or as I guess they might be, those are on a very in a very confined setting. You're asking specific questions, solve specific problems, and so on. The the fantastic inventiveness that gives rise to novel things that can then get passed down. Um, that may also be something special in humans. We all have examples of humans who we think are spectacularly uh, intelligent. They just stand out. They're just different from all the rest. They're not the average child taking the average psychological test. There's something different. Do you think there's any possibility that humans are distinct in that way? Personally, I think we tend to systematically over, like exaggerate the, the, the intelligence of certain individuals. You know, even if you think of outstanding, brilliant individuals, you know, if you think of, let's say, Marie Curie or Leonardo da Vinci, these are also individuals that first were taught for a very long time. They were apprentices for a very long time. They first acquired the vast body of cultural information that had been developed by their ancestors. And then they went one step further, or many steps further, however you want to conceptualize it, but based on this, on this shared cultural knowledge that was transmitted across generations. So even like geniuses like Marie Curie or Leonardo da Vinci, they wouldn't have stood a chance if they had been on their own. If they right. had you know, lived on a desert island, they would have never managed any of these. Uh, any of these. Of course, uh, and, and I'm not placing it as a one or the other. And of course, you need the cultural background to put Leonardo da Vinci in a place where he can do what he does. And you need the cultural transmission in order to carry forward his inventions. There's no doubt you need the culture. No question about that. My, but, but there's a separate question that you can ask which is whether those people really are fantastically talented. And yeah. I, I don't think that's negated by your, your beautiful studies. Oh, that, that, that's right, that's right. I, ju I, just, I just have the feeling that sometimes if you look at pop, uh, like if you look at the media and so on, and if you look how, how much deference we pay to these individuals, I think it's kind of more important to highlight our so social intelligence and not so much the individual intelligence. But I, I also think that this sort of in individual intelligence is not something that makes us so different from other animals. So I can, so as I've been saying, I've, I've worked with, with chimps, especially in Kenya for about 10 years. And you know, over these 10 years, we have given, I don't know, let's say 30 different intelligence tests to the same group of chimpanzees. Now, what we did about two years ago is we wanted to see whether there are particularly intelligent chimps in our group. And it turns out that there's one adult female chimpanzee, Ellie, who is acing all of our intelligence tests. So she's always the best performer in our intelligence tests. And I think this also fits well with one of, you know, Jane Goodall's first descriptions of chimpanzees. She was also describing situations where individual chimpanzees came up with this amazing novel solutions to problems like finding novels, novel tools to crack open nuts. But then what happened is that when this chimpanzee died, the, the amazing cultural innovation died with them. It wasn't passed on across generations. So I, so I totally agree with you. There are sort of outstandingly intelligent humans, but I wanna highlight more the social cooperative intelligence of our species. Jan, uh, a question here is from Werner Hogg. He has a, would you comment on the generational tool of writing to store knowledge beyond what individuals to understand? So we have collective and cumulative knowledge. So there's no doubt that the invention of writing was a huge game changer for cultural evolution. So Notice that for any type of evolution, information has to be successfully transmitted across generations. One type of information that is successfully transmitted across generations is, of course, biological information. It's DNA. And nature's solution to that transmission of information is, is sexual or asexual reproduction. Passing on culture across generations takes much more effort, much more time. You need, as we heard before, adults teaching their children and so on. And so the invention of writing was a huge game changer in that transmission of cultural evolution because suddenly 
you didn't anymore need the adults really to pass on that generate that all that information verbally, but children could just read about all of that information. They could acquire much of that cultural information by reading. There's a very interesting uh, short um, paper by Jared Diamond, where he argues that older individuals, um, that there was a lot of respect for older individuals in earlier hunter-gatherer populations. Why? Because older individuals, they were these amazing sources of cultural information. They could pass on all this cultural information to young learners. But as Jared Diamond argues, our respect for older individuals disappeared to some extent with our invention of writing because suddenly young learners were not as dependent anymore on these older individuals. They could just refer to the books. So yeah, the short answer, sorry if that was a little bit long, yeah. is that writing changed the whole story of cultural evolution. And, and, and now of course with computer storage, we greatly expand our storage capacity and, yeah. and children respect the adults even less. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although there, there, there are some cultural differences there. In some, for example, I, you know, one of the cultures where, where we do work is, is the Samburu culture in, in Kenya. And that's a culture that's defined by a lot of respect for older individuals. It's even what's called a gerontocra gerontocracy. So uh, leadership positions are exclusively um, occupied by older individuals. So I think this sort of lack of respect for older individuals is also a very Western phenomenon. Jan, maybe I can sneak a question in here. Uh, perhaps 50,000 years or so before the invention of writing, was there gradually, evolutionarily, a change in the human voice box, if that's the right term, allowing a greater range of speech that was even a, a, a better uh, precursor to the, to the development of, um, of social intelligence? Absolutely. So I think um, we've just heard that uh, writing was a game ch changer when it comes to cultural evolution. And what you're hinting at is language, a form of vocal communication, is of, was of course also a complete game changer when it comes to cultural evolution. Some people have even argued that language has specifically evolved for this purpose, to allow for more effective teaching across generations. Um, and, you know, yeah, some people think that sort of language was this magic bullet that completely transformed human evolution. That's sh surely the case. Language did transform human evolution. But I would just like to point out that gestural communication, so non-vocal communication, can also be incredibly complex and can probably also allow for the transmission of very complex cultural skills. So, you know, if I, if I have a tool... I mean, sorry, this is a bad example now, but I don't have a better example. I have a tool like a, a pen and I wanna, wanna demonstrate to a young learner how to use this cultural tool. I can of course demonstrate to that young learner without using any language how to use that tool. So yes, language changed human evolution, but I don't think it was quite as important as many people think. Thank you, Jan. We have a question that'll be spoken out loud, I believe by Arapna Rao. Arapna? Hi, thank you. Um, so I have a question about the relationship. So basically, I think you made the claim that culture is nowadays seen as a subset of biology. And I, I take it what you might mean is a capacity for culture, or maybe not, is a subset of biology. And I was wondering um, if maybe you could talk about some of the reasons given for that and whether it's actually something that you need to claim or is, is it particularly relevant for your thesis? Um, I don't know if it's particularly relevant, but you know, we already before had this question about do we have any sort of other genes that specifically code for cooperative abilities in humans? And there are some people that argue, for example, that we have genes that particularly explain our imitative abilities. So the fact that we are so good at imitating other individuals. And imitation is of course one of the main psychological processes through which we learn cultural information across generations. 
And so what people have argued is that we have genes that allow us to participate in cultures. So that's how I how I meant this this uh, or how I yeah that's the sort of meaning behind this term that we are bio biologically evolved to participate in cultures. Okay, thank you. And Aparna, thank you for not correcting the ruinous job I did in pronouncing your name. I think I got it right, Aparna. Thank yeah, you. For the thank you. You got it right. Thank you. <laughs> you bet. Uh, Jan, we have a question here from Michael Snodgrass. He asks, are you familiar with the science fiction novel, Anything You Can Do, dot, 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 by Randall Garrett, which compares an alien with perfect individual memory to a human with not quite, ah, I believe he said not quite cultural memory. Any, does that ring a bell, Randall Garrett's Anything You Can Do? Uh, unfortunately not, unfortunately not. Um, uh, just may maybe you can explain a little bit more about the novel. Just one very short point. If you're if you're interested in um, in aliens, I think Peter Godfrey Smith. Maybe some of you might know uh, his recent book, Other Minds, where he claims that the closest animal that we're ever going to come close to on our planet that is like an alien is the octopus, an an animal that is extremely distantly related from us, but is also highly intelligent. So that's just what that made me think of, sorry. But maybe you can tell me a little bit more about the, about the science fiction novel. All right, Michael, if you're willing to do that, maybe you could type a bit in the, in the chat here. And uh, I see that you've, well, the, the title for those who want to, know, want to remember this is Anything You Can Do. And the author Anything is Randall, Randall Garrett. Yeah, if, can you hear me? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, so it, it was a, a novel uh, where, which uh, explored what would happen if an alien with uh, you know perfect individual memory uh, came down to, and and was you know cutting a devastating swath of the human population, and uh, the the humans decided they would create uh, a human to fight back to him by modifying him to more closely match the alien, and you know the, the Earth people as a whole didn't have perfect cultural memory, but as a whole had better cultural memory than the alien species did, which had perfect individual memory. And it was just an interesting contrast to see playing the one idea of intelligence off against the other idea of intelligence. So, yeah, yeah, read. That, 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 sorry. No, I'm just saying it's a fascinating read. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it sounds interesting and it actually, so it sounds a little bit similar. I, I wonder whether this, this research is explained actually by Neanderthal history, because one another theory that's out there um, argues that Neanderthals only, or basically didn't have cultural intelligence to the same extent that we have. They had more individual intelligence and that might also explain why we outperformed Neanderthals during our evolutionary history. And the, you know, the interesting fact is also, and I, I, this research was in the news quite a bit about five, six years ago, so you might have heard this. We actually, in our genome, we carry between four to 6% Neanderthal DNA. So there seems to have been in interbreeding between Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis about 40,000 years ago. Thanks, Jan. Uh, Eric Yao asked a question regarding I guess, imitation that animals can do. And he's drawing a contrast between that method of, of education and something that, well, here's, here's it is. Isn't it one of the most important factors to cultural communication that humans have a desire to teach? And there seems to be a reverence for knowledge. Do, do we see that in other animals? So, so first of all, I think you're, you're, you're spot on. This desire to teach seems to be really characteristic of our human species. The interesting thing is that, again, there seem to be very pronounced cultural differences when it comes to teaching. So for example, in, in the Western world, let's take for example, the US or Europe as examples, we do very explicit language-based teaching of our children using ostensive cues. So, you know, we might ra raise our eyebrows when we, when we address a child and we would be like, look, this is a child, this is a pen, you can learn it to, to write. But then when you go to other cultures, I can again sort of refer to one of the cultures that I'm uh, working with, the Kikuyu in, in Kenya, you hardly ever see that form of teaching. 
you never see this sort of explicit address of young children. But what you see is very subtle teaching. So that, for example, if let's say a, a Kikuyu parent is preparing a soup, they will sort of slightly adjust their, their body, their position, so that children can better see what they're doing. So it's much more subtle form of teaching, but I think just as effective. And regarding your second question about whether this is something that is human unique, the tendency to teach our young, this is very much an ongoing research topic. And there's a very hot debate in the field about whether you see teaching in other animals or not. I tend to believe that there's no teaching, at least in the way that we see it in humans, but there are some of my colleagues that would definitely agree, uh, disagree with me on this one. Hmm. Uh, Jan, one of our questioners, and we, we'd better draw our, our evening to a close soon, but, but one of our questioners wants to take you to task for um, the, the intelligence demonstrated by Mozart. At, uh, the questioner says at five years old, he sat at the piano and played um, and played a piece with no formal training. Now, is that perhaps a legend, or is there, how, how much are? I guess he's, she's trying to draw a distinction between the social learning and certain special cases of uh, remarkable individual uh, intellectual accomplishment. Yeah, I, I yeah. I, I mean, yeah, Mozart is another interesting example, but I, I think I, I must disappoint you. I would, I would go back to my earlier question and I would still insist that I think also in the Mozart case, there was very important social learning taking place. So if, if I get my facts right here, for example, Mozart had a very demanding father who made sure that Mozart, you know, got the best training and so on from a very, very young age onwards. So there's no doubt that Mozart had these amazing abilities, but again, they built upon this foundation of social learning. So, you know, one other, one other argument or reason that people often appeal to in order to highlight the importance of social intelligence rather than individual intelligence is that if you think about the sort of major technological innovations of our time or the major ideas of our time, it is very often the case that there are two or three individuals that can come up with these new ideas or new technologies at the same time. So people have argued that these new ideas seem to be somehow in the air. They seem to be somehow the nearly logical next step. Of course, you still need these brilliant minds to make these next steps. But again, they seem to stand, I wouldn't actually say on the shoulders of giants like Newton did, they seem to stand on the shoulders of millions of millions of normal people just like us that reliably passed on cultural information across generations. Jan, thank you. I must note here that someone commented that Mozart had a tiger dad. Yes. Yeah, tiger dad. How about as our, as our final question here, I, I don't know if I'll do justice to it, but Stuart Y asks, uh, we, are, we have been progressing through various forms of audio and computer recording media. In the past, we seem to have lost some of the human knowledge through some intentional purges, or maybe the dark ages type of loss, or ignoring of past collected recorded knowledge. Do you think that we may suffer a similar loss due to the inability to read previous generations of computer media? Yeah, that, that's actually something that I'm, I'm worried about. Um, so to, to just give you an example of, 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 of this phenomenon, I think it's already happening actually. So we are right now in the process of doing a meta-analysis on fairness. So the, the big question here is, do other animals besides humans have a sense of fairness? And this is a topic that has been researched in the animal literature for about 20 years. And uh, myself and a PhD student of mine, Odette Ritov, we are trying to look at all the studies that have been published on this topic in the last 20 years. And then we wanna do a, put them all the data together and then do a meta-analysis to see whether there's evidence for a sense of fairness. Now we recently contacted the authors of the first study on a sense of fairness in capuchin monkeys. And this study was published in 2003, so a mere 17 years ago. And the response that we got is, sorry, we can't send you the data because we can't open the data file anymore from 17 years ago. 
So, yeah, I, I, I see that as a real problem that there's so much human information, human cultural knowledge that is going to be lost because our, our technologies innovate so quickly. Jan, uh, before uh, we all give you a well-deserved round of applause, I want to thank a few other folks here. Uh, by the way, to acknowledge that applause without uh, having too much audio interference here, I've learned that the Americans, the sign language method for demonstrating applause is this, the raised hands vibrating back and forth. So. <laughs> First, thank you to our audience here. Thanks for showing up on a, on a Thursday night um, to get smarter, to get informed about cultural intelligence uh, using the phenomenon that was discussed tonight. I thank also the various Wonderfest supporters who have visited wonderfest.org and have become perhaps patrons. That's very kind of you. And in regarding uh, wonderfest.org, please go to that website to learn about our future events. 